everyone, and thank you for the introduction, Megan. It's great to see everyone. Uh, during the presentation today, I'll be sharing findings from my PhD research. So I just would like to begin by acknowledging that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Inuit, Anishinaabek, Dakota Oete, and Dene, and on the national homeland of the Red River Métis. I respect the treaties that were made on these territories. I acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and I dedicate myself to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. The objectives for my presentation today are to identify the extent of evaluation of partner rehabilitation research, examine and explore the perceived effects of partnered rehabilitation research on the research process and outcomes, and also understand how partnering on rehabilitation research contributes to these effects. Uh, before I do that, I'd like to begin acknowledging my positionality with respect to my research. So I am a white female, I'm of middle class and European descent. I'm a pragmatic thinker and I used a pragmatic lens for my research. And so to me, this meant that as I was thinking about the scope of my research, I was considering the real world problems uh, experienced in rehabilitation and thinking about how my research can contribute to solutions um, that, could have, that had a real world uh, applicability. Furthermore, not only did I consider the most appropriate methods to answer my research questions, but I was also thinking about what methods are most fe feasible and realistic for my PhD. As Megan was saying, I'm a licensed physiotherapist and I currently work in a physiotherapy department in a tertiary care hospital in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And my role uh, in the department is to encourage and enhance the use of evidence to inform practice uh, about program evaluation and development and policy development as well. So I get to work with employees in the physiotherapy department on research or quality related improvements that are a priority that, to them that meet their needs and that address the, their observations and the issues they see happening as frontline clinicians. And on a regular basis, I get to work with a group of people who are extremely motivated to use evidence to inform what they're doing. But at the same time, I'm also witness to their frustration and disappointment when there isn't evidence to inform what they're doing. And we have been able to uh, roll out some research projects and quality improvement projects to address these gaps that they're noticing. But the reality is we don't have the capacity nor the resources to address every gap that they're noticing with their clinical practice. Before I talk more about the methods and then the results, I think it's important to define some terms um, of key concepts for my research. And I think it's important to acknowledge that there's in partner research and in rehabilitation, there's a lot of different terms that can be used to describe concepts and then also how to define them as well. So I worked hard at choosing some terms that, and even crafting some uh, definitions that were evidence-based. I defined rehabilitation as a process consisting of the delivery of tailored person-centered interventions for individuals with health conditions, which aim to enhance function, optimize quality of life, independent social integration, minimize disability, and maximize the ability to adapt to changes in an individual circumstances. And this definition was influenced by the World Health Organization and their definition of rehabilitation, but also research conducted by Wade and Arianti. I defined partnered rehabilitation research as a collaboration between research and knowledge users during the rehabilitation process. And this was an umbrella term that I decided upon for my research because it could capture a variety of different ways or approaches to partnering. 
So for instance, it could potentially capture people who may sit situate themselves in community-based participatory research or integrated knowledge translation. I defined evaluation as assessing or measuring the value of the research partnership. And lastly, I chose the term effects and defined it as the unattended, unintended consequences of partner rehabilitation research. Effects, impacts and outcomes are all terms that tend to be used interchangeably in the research. We know this based on some um, recent research that Dr. Merkless has published. And often these times they're, and often at times these terms, they aren't well uh, defined, but they can also be used very interchangeably. And so I opted to use effects consistently throughout my research because I felt it was the best term that could capture the consequences or the effects of partner rehabilitation research for my purposes. So there's evidence that findings from rehabilitation research are underutilized in practice, resulting in a gap between the two. This gap may be in part due to researcher-driven approaches in which researchers predominantly develop research questions, the agendas, the design, they carry out the research and then they share the findings without the involvement of knowledge users in the research. Researcher-driven approaches could develop uh, research that may be perceived as inapplicable uh, by the knowledge users, thus resulting in their underutilization in practice. However, it's encouraging um, because efforts have been made and are being made to move away from these researcher-driven approaches and instead adopt approaches that involve knowledge users in the research. Research conducted with the involvement of knowledge users may contribute to the enhanced uptake of its findings because components uh, such as research agenda setting, research priority setting, research setting the research questions um, they incorporate the perspectives, experiences, and the relative priority of the knowledge users. Uh, some reported benefits of research conducted with knowledge users in include in increased research and partnering capacity of both knowledge users and researchers, improved community services, community empowerment, and healthcare system changes by influencing policy. Studies of partnered rehabilitation research have contributed some understanding about who's involved with the partnerships, uh, understanding um, the strategies and methods to involve knowledge users, when to involve knowledge users, and barriers and facilitators to the partnerships. And this literature represents some phases of the research partnership process, like the preparation and planning, but there's not as much published research on the evaluation and effects of partnered rehabilitation research. And of the, of the published research that exists, it's evident from, uh, from it that evaluation of the partnerships is not consistently carried out. And even when it in, the methods of evaluation are not well described. We do know that there are some challenges of evaluating partnerships. Uh, of the tools that exist to um, measure partnerships or evaluate them, at times they're not based on literature reviews, they're not informed by theoretical frameworks or concepts or conceptual frameworks, and they may even lack some scientific rigor. Evaluating partnered rehabilitation research is necessary to identify the short, medium, and long-term effects related to the partnering process instead of solely relying on uh, individual perceptions. And by identifying the effects of partnered rehabilitation research, we will also deepen our understanding uh, of the effects not only on the patients, but on partners, on organizations, on healthcare systems. Uh, we can confirm assumptions of this approach to research, such as its ability to promote the uptake of evidence and subsequent improvement in health outcomes. And confirming assumptions is necessary and important to ensure we're not misleading people about its potential, which could lead to poor use of research resources or funding. Uh, as well, evaluating partnership 
the partnership and the partnering process can ensure that the integrity that is the concepts uh, that are related to involving knowledge users in the research process are upheld. And finally, evaluating the partnering process can deepen our understanding about how these partnerships work, which may lead to improvements in how researchers and knowledge users partner. So the three overarching questions that really informed my research were, is partner rehabilitation research evaluated? How is it being evaluated? And what are its effects on the research process and outcomes? In order to answer these questions, I conducted an explanatory sequential mixed method study that included surveys and interviews. The surveys, uh, it was an online survey and it was, I uh, conducted it in the summer of 2023. It was open for four weeks and it was situated in an international context. Individuals were eligible for the survey if they were researchers or knowledge users who were involved in partnered rehabilitation research. I partnered with several international organizations who shared information about the survey, either in an email or on their websites with their members. And then I analyzed the results from the survey descriptively. Consistent with a mixed methods approach, results from my survey informed aspects of the interviews. So for instance, the results from the survey influenced who I sampled for the interviews, but then results from the survey also informed questions that I asked in the interviews specific to the evaluation tools or measures that people were using to evaluate um, the partnerships, but also informing questions that I had about how um, the partner process contributed to the effects. Uh, the interviews were situated within a qualitative descriptive design, and it was specific to a Canadian context. Uh, the interviews I completed via MS Teams between January and April of 2024. Uh, again, individuals had to be knowledge users or researchers involved in partner rehabilitation research to be eligible. I used purposive and snowball sampling to recruit participants. Um, and I also employed uh, member checking. I kept field notes and thick description to enhance confidence in the results of the interviews. And then I analyzed the results from the interviews uh, thematically. And the thematic analysis was informed by Braun and Clark. So beginning with the survey results, unfortunately, the survey did not reach uh, a, a large number of respondents at, at all. And I think only about 30 people re responded to the survey and of that 14 were eligible and included in data analysis. As you can see, most of the respondents were white, Canadian women, and they were identified as researchers. In terms of evaluation, most respondents said they were evaluating, they were using a tool or instrument to do so, and that tool or instrument they developed internally, meaning they weren't using an existing tool or instrument to evaluate specific to the perceived effects on the research process, I'll just highlight a few. So most respondents perceived that the partnership and the partnering process had a moderate to significant effect on choosing research questions, participant recruitment, data collection, data analysis and interpretation, and disseminating findings to non-academic audiences. However, most respondents did not perceive that the partnership um, had much or any influence on developing the research uh, ethic documents. Specific to perceived effects on the research outcomes, again, just sharing a few of the results, most respondents uh, perceived that the partnership had a moderate or significant effect on knowledge user employment, on researchers' capacity for partnered research, and the production of useful research findings for knowledge users and evidence-informed clinical decision-making uh, by knowledge users. Uh, most respondents uh, perceived that the partnership had no or little effect on health system policy changes. I conducted 13 interviews, seven of which were with researchers and the remaining six with knowledge users. Most of the participants in the interviews were white and women. 
Uh, I interviewed individuals from BC, Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario, and Quebec. Six researchers had clinical training and rehabilitation, meaning they were physiotherapists, and that was three people. Two people were an occupational therapist, and one person was a speech and language pathologist. Of the six knowledge users, three had lived experience with a health condition. Two were rehabilitation clinicians working in a private clinic. One was a speech and language pathologist and one was a prosthetist. And then one, uh, the last knowledge user was an individual who had experience in policy making in a health, in a public healthcare setting. The first thing that became evident from the interviews is that none of the participants were evaluating their partnership or the partnering process. When asked, the partnerships acknowledged they perceived value in evaluating the partnerships. For instance, one knowledge user perceived that evaluation would help um, get better at doing research together. Another participant shared that evaluating was a way to confirm that knowledge users were involved in the research process. And this was important because ensuring the patient perspective is included in research produces higher quality and better research. I specifically asked the researchers why they weren't evaluating their partnerships and they identified uh, some challenges or barriers to the evaluation. One researcher said, um, I think that I'm always worried about the burden of participation. So I try not to add layers, right? And another researcher commented, while there's always value, but is it realistic or practical? I don't think so. It's just endless, the list of partners, right? Despite not completing evaluations, all participants were able to describe uh, their perceptions of the effects of the partnership on the research process and outcomes and how they perceive partnering contribute to those effects. My analysis of the interviews generated one overarching theme, that is the effects are extensive, that really captured uh, participants' insights that they perceived the effects were more than on the research process and outcomes, and it included effects on individuals as well. To capture the specific effects of the partnership, I constructed two sub-themes, that is the beginning, middle, and end, and opportunity for learning. The third sub-theme I created was how partnering influences effects, and this really um, um, highlighted participants' thoughts about how various factors related to partnering are what contributed and influenced the effects of the partnership. So starting with the beginning, middle, and end, this some, something reflects the effects can occur throughout the research process. So at the beginning during preparation and planning, in the middle during conducting, and at the end when the uh, findings are being applied. So in the beginning, the partnership influenced uh, the types of questions that were asked. Uh, it brought a diversity of expertise to the study designs and influenced how methods were planned. As one researcher commented, clinical questions are much more targeted to what is clinically useful. There were also perceived effects of the partnership on the middle of the research process, such as par participant recruitment, data collection, and analysis. And one knowledge user shared um, their insights of their involvement of creating participant um, recruitment materials. And this individual really had to encourage the knowledge, the uh, researchers to take off their application writing skills and talk in a lay language in the recruitment materials. Finally, the partnership had effects on the end phases of the research process, which often involved the application, such as the sharing of research findings. And this was captured by respondents speaking to how um, partnering during partnering, they were involved in manuscript writing or how they included knowledge users in the sharing of those research findings at conferences. And one researcher talked, uh, stated that particularly at conferences, when we do seminars, workshops, or panel discussions, they, being the knowledge users, bring that element or that perspective that researchers cannot. And so it does help immensely with the effectiveness of the delivery or sharing or dissemination. 
So opportunity for learning is a sub theme that highlights what researchers and knowledge users gained themselves as individuals by being involved in the partner rehabilitation research. One on uh, knowledge, uh, one researcher commented that I think these partnerships are the kind of vehicle that we're able to use to create an understanding of the breadth of the healthcare system. One knowledge user was also commenting on their involvement in the partnership in the partnering process and really felt like it helped them to gain a better understanding of the research process and different phases in the research process, such as developing questions or developing methods. This researcher stated that they learned um, what are good questions to ask and how do you go about answering that? The final sub-theme was how partnering, how partnering influences effects. And again, this is a sub-theme that really captured uh, participants' perceptions of the factors they felt really contributed to those effects that were brought about. And these factors were maybe individual factors. They may be factors related to uh, the context that the partnering was occurring in, or even related to how the partners ended up working and collaborating together. Some participants specifically highlighted how departmental or organizational leader support was a factor which contributed to the positive effects of the partnership. And as one knowledge user stated, so they, both the executive director and president of the board, had an appreciation for research and wanted to support that. Participants also highlighted how things like terms of reference, research agreements, or charters were used as roadmap, roadmaps to help guide how partners work together. Participants also talked about how individual characteristics contribute to partnering and the effects. And here participants spoke about things like being interested in research and partnering, having a curiosity, enthusiasm, being open-minded, adaptable, and motivated were all individual characteristics that influence the effects. Furthermore, there was also an acknowledgement that humility was another individual characteristic that was necessary for partnerships. And this was really specific to the researchers and their acknowledgement that they might not necessarily know what is important in terms of research to end users, but also recognizing that they didn't, they don't necessarily know everything about research or the research process. And as one researcher commented, you have to acknowledge that what you see as a researcher is one tiny slice, and you really have to be relying on others to guide you. Participants also uh, described how they partnered and worked together on research influenced the effects. And in this instance, they described um, the fact that partners needed to have trust, reliability, and accountability. The partnership needed to have role def definition and clarity. And there also needed to be respect among the partners. And in one knowledge user stated, I think it was also really nice knowing that as an academic, she respected what we saw as a research question, right? Minimizing power imbalances or differentials was another aspect of how partners work together that really came about, I would say, in nearly all the interviews. Participants here spoke about how all partners needed to be on an equal footing and the level and a playing field needed to be level for everyone. And when I decided to press participants a little bit more about how minimizing power, power imbalances or differentials is actually experienced or operationalized, I heard some different things. From one knowledge user, this person stated that, uh, or perceived that it was necessary for knowledge, for the researchers to just thank knowledge users for their contributions to the partnering process. One knowledge user in particular stated, I only use my first name. I don't wear a lab coat. I have the space and the time to listen, to engage and to get to know people, taking the time to hear their knowledge users' thoughts. However, there are also several factors that were perceived as 
challengers to partnering and contributed to the effects. And often these were out of control of the partners. And it was the researchers that really commented on some of these factors. They spoke about the challenges getting funding for partnerships, acknowledging that usually funding funds research, not developing, maintaining, or sustaining partnerships. They commented how some funding had really high expectations of the knowledge users and perceived that knowledge users had to really jump through hoops to be involved as co-investigators on some of the proposals and those funding applications. They perceived there was challenges when they put their proposals into the ethics boards to recognize or to have the ethics boards accept that what they were proposing for compensation was acceptable and, and reflective of the time and commitment that the knowledge users were giving. And then lastly, one researcher was commenting on how COVID really impacted the ability of those partnerships to continue and research to continue. And because many of this person's partners were clinicians having to work on the front line, many of their partnerships were actually paused and many of the research that they were conducting together as partners was paused as well. So another way that my research was consistent with the mixed methods approach was that I integrated results from both studies to try to offer a more comprehensive understanding, evaluation, and effects of partner rehabilitation research. I do think it's important to acknowledge that there is obviously a discrepancy in my findings regarding the evaluation of partner rehabilitation research. So again, survey most respondents in the survey indicated they had evaluated partnerships, whereas in the interviews, none of those participants had stated they were evaluating the partnerships. And I su suspect there could be a difference. There could be many, a few factors of why these differences um, existed. As I already said, the sample for the survey was very small, and I'm hesitant to rely too much on those findings to really give me an indication of what is happening in terms of evaluation of partner rehabilitation research. Uh, the other thing with interviews, um, perhaps as many of you know, is, is when you're interviewing people and you know maybe they're having some difficulty, maybe you haven't explained a question well or haven't the answer asked a question as clearly as possible, you have this opportunity to offer some clarity or to further describe or explain that concept or phenomenon that you're, that you're researching. And I did have to do this at times during the interviews. And so I just wonder, you know, what kind of impact does that have in being able to explain something more clearly and helping someone to really decide whether or not they're engaging in a particular behavior like evaluation. I had hoped the interviews were going to expand my understanding of evaluation of partnering research, particularly about what tools are being used, what tools or measures are being used to evaluate the partnerships, why those tools are being chosen, if they were internally developed, how were they internally developed, and what concepts went into them. And even though the interviews really didn't achieve this, I did learn that nearly everyone perceived value in evaluating partnerships, which was not captured in the survey. And I think this is important because it may give some insight into individuals' desire or potential motivation to evaluate partnerships. As well, upon learning more uh, participants in the interviews were not evaluating their partnerships, I was able to pivot a little bit and explore why this was and learned about some barriers that researchers were perceiving that really influenced the ability to evaluate the partnerships that they were in. Findings from my study found that partnered rehabilitation research does affect evidence-informed clinical decision-making in healthcare by knowledge users and the production of useful research findings. And while I didn't really mention it, in the interviews, knowledge users discussed how the partnership gave them the chance to use best practices in clinical settings. And this is an encouraging result because partnered research does position itself as an approach 
to research that assumes involving knowledge users in the research process will enhance the uptake of research findings. So evidence uptake in research in rehabilitation is a challenge and knowing that participants may participate part uh, partnerships may facilitate it may help convince knowledge users in healthcare settings to become involved in partnered rehabilitation research, especially if they would like to enhance evidence informed decision making. But furthermore, and even more importantly, I feel like these findings can be used to advocate to decision makers for the involvement of knowledge users and really encourage decision makers to allow for the dedicated resources, the dedicated time, and the dedicated infrastructure to allow you know, uh, rehabilitation clinicians to be involved in partial research, because by doing so, it could ensure that those uh, rehabilitation therapists use evidence to inform their uh, clinical practice. So I think one future direction for research, um, I really don't think my research has answered conclusively the idea of evaluation and partner, re partner rehabilitation research. There's still, I feel like I still have some unknowns about the behavior. Is it being done and to what extent? So I wonder if using uh, if in future research using an established framework like the COMB to explore the behavior, specifically the evaluation of partner rehabilitation research would be um, a feasible next step. The COMB is a framework and it can help to organize concepts, thinking and observations around evaluation and partner rehabilitation research. It can offer clarity on aspects of evaluation, and it can also maybe help to um, um, determine challenges, facilitators, barriers to the evaluation of partner rehabilitation research. I think that as well, uh, once we learn more about the behavior of evaluation, and really those barriers and facilitators, the value of something of using something like the COMB is that it can be paired with the behavior change wheel, which may also then provide insights on the interventions that could help facilitate the behavior such as evaluation, which can then encourage uh, the adoption of evaluation of partnered rehabilitation research. So even though my study contributed some new findings to partner rehabilitation research about perceived effects of the partnerships, about how those partnering contribute to these effects, honestly, they weren't really new insights when they're compared to the broader partnered health research. So when I'm talking about partnered health research, I'm talking about research that has really grouped all health partnerships together when they've been evaluating them. So it may include rehabilitation studies, but usually includes met studies of partnered research in medicine or in nursing. So studies of partnered health research have reported on the inconsistency of evaluating these partnerships, the effects of knowledge users on the research process, on outcomes, it's identified barriers and facilitators to partnerships and identified strategies and approaches to enhance the effects of the partnerships. So recognizing there is a lot of similarity in the results between partnered health research and partnered rehabilitation research, I've really been wondering what this means for these partnerships, what it means for how we decide to conduct research about partnered, um, uh, partnered research, about if the results are perhaps transferable or generalizable between disciplines, if at the end of the day, the fundamentals of partnering really don't differ between something like rehabilitation, uh, partnered research, or maybe a partnered research specific to medicine or health.
I don't necessarily have answers to these yet, but that's kind of where my thinking has been going um, around some of these findings. So just reviewing uh, the objectives for today's session were to identify the extent of partnered, ext extensive evaluation of partnered rehabilitation research. And I think my findings show that there is inconsistency in evaluation. And I don't think I've really identified the extent of evaluation in this area yet. Uh, uh, the, we also examine and explore the perceived effects of partner rehabilitation research on the research processing outcomes and highlighted some of those effects for you. And then lastly, uh, understand how partnering on rehabilitation research contributes to those effects. And I shared some um, various perceptions, um, particularly from the interviews on what those participants felt was how, um, what were the factors contributing to the effects of partnering. And with that, uh, I am done the presentation and there is my email address if anybody does have any questions for me. <clears throat> Thank you, Brenda, excellent. Um, so if there's any questions from the crowd, please feel free to uh, put them in the chat or to raise your hand if you'd like to say it out loud to the group. Um, I'll have some questions here myself. Um, Brenda, why did you choose the term um, partnered rehabilitation research for your work? Um, yes, thanks for the question. So I, we wanted I wanted to find an umbrella term that can capture a variety of approaches to partnering. This research itself, wasn't a partnership per se, and we were intending to evaluate the partnering process. So we were intending to evaluate how researchers and knowledge users partnered, worked, collaborated together when they were conducting research, particularly rehabilitation research. So considering that, uh, myself and my advisory committee, we perceived that the term partnered rehabilitation research was a better term to capture what we were doing for my PhD research. Awesome. Thank you. Um, um, and you mentioned about um, like the limitations of having a small sample for your survey. Mm -hmm. Did you find um, other limitations sort of in general with your work? Yeah, I think the first thing um, that needs to be acknowledged is most of the participants were white and they were females. Um, and rehabilitation in particular, I think that... Um, you know, other voices, uh, brown, black, indigenous people, they aren't well represented just in rehabilitation in general, but then also in research. And so I think that for us to, or for me to generalize and say this research reflects the experiences of everyone in partnered rehabilitation, I think there's some caution with that. And really have to be aware of when you are white and you are maybe the voice that's mostly represented, we're really not capturing um, those perspectives of individuals that may have di very different experiences in rehabilitation or even in research. And they may, you know, if I was to talk with more individuals that weren't women or weren't white, what kind of um, contributions would they have made to this to this research and so I think that should be acknowledged yeah for sure thank you um Dr. Sibley would you like to ask a question sure thanks great <laughs> job Brenda I'm thanks, lucky because hey. I get to uh <laughs> um go along go along for the ride and see the all the iterations um and uh Again, great job today. One of the things that just listening to it all together made me reflect on 
was really around the potential limits of sort of self-report among teams um, working in partnership and the inconsistencies between the survey findings yeah. and the interviews as you have raised. And we haven't really talked about this yet, but I'm, I feel like that's something to think on in terms of next steps, sort of what would we do differently or are there different data sources that might better tackle this question or do we just move on to something else? Have, I'm mm. wondering if we may want to reflect out loud on that or yeah. how you've thought about that. I think in answer to the second part of do we just move on, that's something I think we've kind of talked a little bit about what we haven't explored more when we've been chatting, but it is something I've been reflecting on. And when there's these similarities, again, like my findings, they maybe contributed something new specific to the rehab partnerships. They weren't new to those broader health research partnerships. And so I really wonder if we do need to move on from investigating certain aspects of these partnerships. You know, I really don't think we need to necessarily know more about the barriers and facilitators to partnerships. We know what they are. I don't think they're going to change significantly. We know about the approaches or strategies to engage partners. They're not going to change significantly. And so I think there are aspects of the partnership research that we should move on from. But in terms of this, the perceptions that researchers may have and then the perceptions of knowledge users and that they that they can be different, I think there could be ways to look at those differences in perceptions to really kind of maybe get into how different they are or at what points are they different. But I think to do so, you might need larger amount of data or larger data sets in, in able to do that. Like you need sufficient samples to be able to say, oh, you know, if you have a survey and here's how a bunch of researchers responded, but here's how a bunch of re knowledge users responded. If you only have three of each, can you really make a lot of in, uh, interpretations about that. So I think it's the ability to also have larger data sets that, you know, could potentially allow us to compare some differences in how individuals are responding and how the different types of partners are responding to see if it is consistent that all res researchers respond this way or all knowledge users respond this way, or are there other nuances of the partnerships that indicate how they respond and to access that data, I mean, I know you've done some research where you've accessed data from provincial sites that keep track of who has received funding and who has engaged in partnerships for that funding. But is there other ways to kind of gather that data to get a lot more information? There could be. Yeah, I don't know if that kind of answers what you were wondering, Kate. Yeah, no, I liked your um, idea and proposal about linking this to something like COMB and the behavior change wheel. Like, I think I, I agree there's probably enough there that now we could move on to that and start to think about strategy. So, yeah, great job. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Juglal has her hand up as well. You're just on mute. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> so sorry about that. Very nice presentation. So I have a couple of questions mm -hmm. um, for you. And and the first one is um, at the start of the presentation, you presented a, a your own definition of rehab. Mm -hmm. And and so my my question is, why did you feel the need to create your own definition? Yeah. Thanks for your question. Because I thought, and I think this is where my perspective as a physiotherapist and my experience as a physiotherapist also kind of influenced part of the part of my research is that when I was looking at some of the existing definitions, like the World Health Organization, I wasn't convinced that that definition in itself was capturing all concepts that I felt 
rehabilitation entail? So I looked at what I actually did was I looked to some research that Arianti had did and they compared a variety of different rehabilitation definitions and they pulled consistent concepts throughout these definitions. And so what I did was I kind of looked at, well, what are the consistent concepts that they identified that should be in a rehabilitation definition? And then I tried to develop a definition that included most of those concepts. And so that's why I crafted a definition uh, for rehabilitation for my PhD. Okay, thank you. And I have another, can I ask another question? Um, I guess it, it, it goes back to, like you said, you had very different participants in the surveys versus the mm -hmm. The interviews. So could you remind me how you went about um, recruiting uh, participants for, for those two aspects of your study? Yeah. And, so, and what would you do like sort of differently mm, if you were mm -hmm. to do it again? Yeah. So for the surveys, what we did is we looked at organization, international organizations that we felt encompassed the principles or were consistent with how I was conceptualizing rehabilitation for my research. And so we looked at various contents. We looked at, okay, what are the rehabilitation organizations there? Do they seem to embody similar concepts of rehabilitation that I have for my research? We reached out to them and we asked, would you be willing to share our survey or a link to our survey with your members um, in whatever ways you feel appropriate? And so that's how we did that for the survey. And oh goodness, I can't remember off the top of my head, but was there maybe seven or eight various organizations from different continents that agreed to share our research? Mm -hmm. And honestly, most of them were from North America or even from Canada. It was hard to connect with other organizations that could potentially have individuals that were rehabilitation therapists or rehabilitation research as members. And so they shared their information with um, their uh, members. And then that's how we got um, our survey uh, participants. And then in terms of the interview, because we recognized that it was challenging to get an international perspective and it was a lot of work. And so we thought, okay, how can we maybe narrow the scope and really do much more targeted approach to recruitment that it may be a lot of work, but we may have more um, efforts to show for the labor. And so here we opted to kind of narrow our scope, to scope to Canada, but then also, you know, some of the research specific to partnered rehabilitation research has been done in Canada. So then by keeping the context to Canada, mm. we thought, okay, we can maybe build on that research that's already been looked at in a Canadian context. In particular, in specific to, you know, what would I change? You know, hindsight is always 50-50. And I think going back to the survey, I would have opted not to do an international context Part of our rationale for that was most research on partnered rehabilitation research has been done in high income countries. And so, you know, getting pers perspectives from, say, middle or low income countries for individuals in those countries, it may give us something new, some new information about the partnerships. But, you know, in hindsight, I think if we could have done a targeted recruitment within Canada, I, I wonder if we would have had, had might may have had more respondents. Um, and also, if we would have been a bit more flexible in how we use the definition of rehab to inform that recruitment, like we really stuck to, it had to be a rehabilitation organization for the survey. We mm. talked about, well, let's recruit through the Canadian Physio Association. Let's recruit for through occup occupational therapy organizations. But then we were struggling with, well, how do we decide which international organizations to approach because there are so many and so we Isn't just it? didn't feel that'd be feasible so I think maybe having a bit more if we would have kept it to a Canadian context we could have recruited you know potential participants through organizations in Canada specific to some of these 
um, uh, healthcare professionals that typically occupy the rehabilitation space. So do you think, do you think you really have a, you ended up with a sequential mixed methods design? Huh. I do because we did, you know, when I'm thinking about the mixing phase, we did use, even though maybe the survey res results weren't what I was expecting, we did still use those results to inform the next phase of the interview, such as the sampling and the questions. Um, I do spend time in the dissertation trying discussing more of the integration of the results and oh, okay. the broader implications. I mean, I didn't really get into it here, but I am trying to do that in my dissertation. So, yeah, I, I think that um, I was true to, you know, a sequential mixed methods design. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we do have a question in the chat. Yeah. I think the question asker had to jump off, but yeah. let's let's respond to it anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have time. Um, and they asked, does the did the partnership involve um, rehab researchers as well or knowledge user only? No, it was both researchers and knowledge users. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That was easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we do have five. Could speak to one more question, I think. Um, could you talk about um, standardized measures and do you like, do you advocate for the use of standardized mm. measures? Oh, sorry, Dr. Jagla has another question. Yeah, oh. I'm gonna give her priority. Yeah, <laughs> oh, for sure. You know. Oh yeah, no, no, I guess I, I guess my question is, it, it's kind of a follow-up to mm -hmm. um, uh, Dr. Sibley's question and it was one of the things I, I was wondering I was wondering too in in that um what sort of new insights do you think you've you've learned from this and and do you just say okay we move on or um you, you know we do we, we do further research because I'm wondering if people just thought well we think this is this is a good idea Mm -hmm. um so we're just like why do we need to evaluate it mm. then it's yeah it, it's like a done deal oh yeah 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 I think for me I do think there is still value in looking at evaluation a bit more in partnered rehabilitation research or even more broadly in the health research partnerships as well. While I do appreciate there are some short-term positive effects of the partnering process, you know, we identified that partnering, it influences the, the questions, the research priorities, it influences how the research is carried out and even some outcomes you know, the uptake of evidence, but I'm still wondering about, well, what about those effects or outcomes or consequences that maybe we don't see in the life of a partnership, but maybe they take a bit more time. So what about the effects on the healthcare system? We really, I didn't really get any insight on whether or not the partnering process from individuals in my research were noticing those effects, you know, down the road on the healthcare system and what they could be. And again, partnering or some approaches in partnering, they really, it seemed they position themselves as if you partner, there's increased evidence, and this can also make the healthcare system work better. And I'm hesitant or I guess I ask, can we really say that without mm. the evidence? And so I'm wondering, do we have the best, have we figured out the best ways to capture that? Are we not asking the right people those questions? Are we not asking the right questions about that? Are we not using the right methods to be able to find that? So I guess for me, that's why I'm, you know, while I appreciate there was definitely inconsistencies in my study findings, and maybe it didn't really contribute much to evaluation itself. I don't think we should stop necessarily investigating the evaluation aspect, 
but there could be other parts of the partnerships that maybe we could move on from researching. Yeah, because I was that was one of the other questions I had, sort of like a follow up to this in terms of thinking, does the partnership really result in sort of better outcomes? Mm -hmm. And 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 do you do you know that? So it's, it's just something to, to yeah. sort of to to think about. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, thanks so much uh, to everyone for their questions. And thank you, Brenda, for uh, thank you. your presentation. Um, I'm going to put the link to the evaluation in the chat. So if anyone, uh, if everyone could complete it, that would be great. I'll send it by email as well, just um, so you have it. And uh, our next webinar will be on uh, November 14th. And we're going to have um, Kayla Torino Miranda, who's presenting on um, her work uh, on inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility as it relates to the CanSolve project, which is, um, I believe CanSolve is a chronic kidney disease related uh, project. So that'll be coming up in a month-ish. Um, so thanks again, Brenda, and uh, thanks to, to the audience for joining and for your questions and um, wishing everybody a great uh, rest of your day. Take care. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.